and welcome to the webinar, Preserving the Value of Transatlantic Relations, A View from the Next Generation. My name is Laura Groenendaal. I am Research and Projects Associate at the German Marshall Fund. And this event was organized by GMF in partnership with the US Embassy to Belgium. Uh, this event will focus on transatlantic relations, um, over the last seven decades, Europe and the United States have been each other's closest allies, and a transatlantic relationship will be very important to counter future challenges ranging from defense and cybersecurity to climate change and the promotion of democracy. Uh, the aim of this discussion is really to shed some light on perspectives from young professionals on transatlantic relations, not only because we will be tomorrow's leaders, but also because we have a high stake in a transatlantic agenda of the future. Uh, we have a great panel with us today, uh, but before I turn to that, I would also like to raise your attention that if you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to add them in the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, before I give the word to our panel, I would like to turn to Mr. Sean Gray, who is Counselor for Political and Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy to Belgium, uh, for some introductory remarks. So over to you, Mrs. Gray. Thank you, Laura, for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. And it's my pleasure to be with all of you today. I'd like to thank the German Marshall Fund and also the Office of Public Diplomacy at the U.S. Embassy in Belgium for co-hosting this seminar which is the third and last in a series focusing on the importance and future of the transatlantic relationship. My thanks also to our panelists today and to all of the participants who've joined us for what I know will be a very engaging discussion. The future of transatlantic relations, in fact, is a very timely topic. It was the primary focus of US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's visit here to Brussels last week, as a matter of fact. It is likely not lost on anyone that trust in the transatlantic relationship has been shaken in recent years. The good news is that we are now seeing a renewed commitment to and optimism in the power of multilateralism and especially in the power of the transatlantic relationship to confront today's most pressing problems. Europe has been and remains today our closest ally on the world stage, thanks to our long history of shared values. Today's challenges, such as combating the COVID-19 pandemic, addressing climate change, and countering the risks posed by countries like China, among many others, make it more evident than ever that multilateral cooperation must be at the forefront of our foreign policies. The United States wants to seize this opportunity to revitalize our relationship with Europe and to reaffirm our commitment to democracy, human rights, open markets, and the rule of law common values that have been tested both from within and outside of our countries. How we choose to respond to this global crisis that we face today has far reaching implications for our collective security and prosperity. And history has shown us that we are only as strong as our weakest link. History has also shown us that we are better off maintaining strong alliances and tackling these challenges together. In doing so, we are building our resilience and preparedness for the future. Fruits of such cooperation are already visible, in fact, on a bilateral level. For example, right here in Belgium, which has long been a trusted and reliable partner of the United States. By way of example, US-Belgian cooperation in biotechnology is really spearheading global COVID-19 vaccine production and distribution. The United States' re-entry into the Paris Agreement is an important opportunity to tackle climate issues together, including with Belgium, which has set its own aggressive climate goals. And we're pleased to see that Belgium's 5G network will be free of untrusted vendors and that human rights abuses in China are receiving increasing attention in Belgium. I'm encouraged to see that momentum is already gathering, both in America and in Europe, to rebuild and reinforce our multilateral efforts in the face of serious global problems. And it will be the next generation of leaders, such as those on the panel today, that will carry this torch into the future. Thank you again for allowing me to say just a few words of welcome, and I look forward to today's discussion. Laura, I'll pass the floor back to you now to get us started. Thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing these insights and for highlighting really the need for transatlantic uh, collaboration. 
Uh, that also brings me to today's first speaker on the panel, uh, Captain John Jacobs, who is the director of Atlantic Forum. Um, he's a millennial himself, and he's also been actively involved with NATO youth engagement. So from your perspective, John, how do younger generations see the transatlantic relationship in Europe? And what are considered the most important issues? Great. Thank you, Laura. Also, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the pronunciation of Jacobs is very, very Dutch. Give something away. Uh, no, thank you for this. Um, I've been involved with this for a couple of years now, and I like to think, but perhaps it could also be that I'm just more attuned to it now, but I like to think that, say, over the past six years or so, translancism, NATO, um, and so on, have become more visible for our generation. Um, I feel that around me, I hear more and more people say, well, hey, wait, what about that American transatlantic relationship? Or, hey, shouldn't we be caring about this a bit more? Um, and this is often involves political discussions. Um, apparently, we in the Netherlands recently just had our elections, so we're now trying to form a government. Um, and part of that are then, of course, discussions eventually about uh, how you're going to spend your money and therefore also the 2% discussion. Um, and what I recently heard in the discussion, which I, I don't think I've heard before yet, is that people were upset about how uh, politicians were basically not caring about that we made an agreement, that you had this sort of like, uh, I don't care agreement. And people were visibly upset about that. And that, for me at least, was the first time that I really noticed that in, in the past five, six years that I've been uh, working on, on youth and youth engagement. So there I see a, a very positive trend. At the same time, I also find it very sad that we still are not there. Um, but again, positive note, uh, people are starting to care. And I think that we should value that and then we should try and exploit it a bit more. Um, here in the Netherlands, um, I'm just main, only speaking about, about this audience now, um, the Atlantic Committee, uh, the Dutch branch of the Atlantic Treaty Association recently published a study that they've been uh, conducting, or basically that Qantar has been conducting for them. And that also shows uh, at least a positive looking uh, outlook on, on that people um, at least know what NATO is. The, the, the numbers sort of are, are speaking in our favor. It's still in my, I, I feel too low, um, but I was particularly fond to see that about half of the young people that they were questioned, they seem to care. And I think that is, is pretty high because normally when you talk about what do young people care about, it's often about climate, it's about education, it, it's sort of about the more softer topics, if you will, which are of course super, super important. Um, but if everything is important, then, then nothing is. So I was quite happy to see there was a, uh, in essence, a change to, to defense and then transatlantic orient uh, questions. Um, now how can we then, of course, do better? I think we're, we've been doing better over the past few years. Um, mostly looking at the types of engagements that, that have been conducted, uh, of course, also by uh, GMF, the, the Brussels Forum, which I was happy to take part in in 2018. Um, I think the application for that is, is open at the moment as well, so everyone should apply for that. But it's these kind of engagements that show that young people can actually have an impact, that, that you are being taken serious um, and that you should, should go for that, basically. Um, I think there it also helps that, that NATO has been proactively uh, taking an approach to, to including youth. Um, of course, the 2030 Young Leaders, um, I think that that's a, a wonderful example. I think the first in, in, in its lifetime that we have basically said, right, we're seriously going to listen to young people. Um, but also in the past few years, the, the NATO Engages series, uh, of course, uh, fellow panelist Lauren is, is a, uh, probably the person to talk about, so I'll leave that to her. Uh, but GMF has was also been a uh, valuable partner in, in that sense. Um, but it really had young people on the stage uh, showing and, and telling to the world, like, hey, this is what we think, rather than having what sort of was the old style of youth engagements, like, right, you have youth in the audience somewhere, We'll make a photo op, we'll have them clap and say, look, we've done youth engagement, check in the box, let's go. Um, so we've definitely seen a very positive change there. Um, and, and that's something I think we should just simply continue. 
Great, thank you, John. Very, uh, very positive note. Um, so, in generally, young people in the Netherlands seem to care about transatlantic relations. Um, there's this positive um, um, uh, focus on engagement. Um, I would actually now like to turn to the other side of the Atlantic, to Lauren Speranza, uh, who is the director of Transatlantic Defense and Security at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Um, Laura, do you share this perception? How do young Americans see the transatlantic relationship? Is that similar as we just heard from John or can you really identify differences? Thanks so much, Laura, and thank you for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here talking about um, these issues. It's my favorite topic, so I'm glad to be here and um, great to, to follow John. Um, yes, I mean, I think I have lots of agreement, but also some challenges um, just to, to some of the things that John raised that look a little bit different on the other side of the Atlantic. But um, I have been doing a lot of work on this issue set at SIPA. And so I thought I would just share a couple of insights from, from the research and, and interviews that I've been conducting with next generation representatives um, across America and also on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, my general take is, you know, just to, to set the scene a little bit, I think the next generation in large part, thanks to NATO, has experienced the longest relative period of peace in history. And we need to recognize that this means that this whole new generation of post-Cold War citizens of the Alliance have really grown up in an entirely different environment, you know, much less characterized by things like great power conflict and much more characterized by things like disinformation and cyber attacks and health crises. And now as these individuals are beginning to take up roles in national governments and even institutions like NATO to an extent, they have a much different set of priorities um, than today's current policymakers that are more in line with future threats, I would argue. And um, as these leaders prepare to take the reins of the alliance, you know, their role is to help NATO anticipate some of these challenges, to prepare and adapt for the future, and offer some new and creative ideas and, and their innovative spirit as well, to help ensure that NATO stays relevant and fit for purpose in a modern world, and to make sure that NATO can continue to safeguard the values, the shared values in our way of life and the international order that has kept us free and safe for so long. So the Alliance cannot risk losing this next generation of transatlantic leaders, many of whom, although probably not in this virtual room, um, are, are skeptical or either unaware of NATO's enduring importance. So we really have to bring these voices into the fold now so that we don't end up in a scenario where NATO is viewed as outdated or doesn't have the buy-in of the next generation. So a couple of things that stuck out to me just throughout my, my conversations, and, and these are somewhat general, so I'd be curious to hear others' thoughts in the Q&A, but... I think um, in terms of, you know, does NATO matter to the next generation, especially in America? I think the historical or ancestral connection between Europe and the United States and the sort of shared values, our ancestors fought together in World War II to build our world kind of argument still resonates, um, but it's with a more limited portion of next generation folks. And it's still rather an elite cohort. Um, so I think this means we need to find new ways of talking about NATO, especially as those pages of history sort of fall farther back in the books. So storytelling is of course a key part of that, but it's also about creating new shared experiences for the next generation with NATO. The second thing I would say is, um, for many issues that young people, broadly speaking, care about, so things like John mentioned, like cyber, technology, arms control, disinformation, you know, the, the Alliance is already doing some work or at least talking about these issues, um, but next-gen individuals aren't always that familiar with it. And in part, I think, you know, maybe there's a comms issue there in terms of how we're presenting these issues, but I think also they're just more interested in the UN or the WHO or Silicon Valley or maybe the EU. And I think that stems from their life experiences. You know, hard security hasn't been the number one challenge. They've dealt with things like global financial crises and counterterrorism issues and humanitarian disasters, not great power wars. And, and even though NATO is doing some of those other things, it's not what they inherently think of. Um, and the third thing I would say is just um, what seems to matter to the youth that I have spoken with has been Yes, having a NATO that looks more like them, that is more inclusive and diverse and representative. But for this generation, you know, that's not just about demographics and statistics. It's really about giving young leaders a chance to contribute ideas to NATO's debates and policies and feel like their, their views and their opinions are heard and valued. So as, as John said, I think we have to give NATO a ton of kudos there and, and 
other organizations in civil society for the great work they've been doing very recently, you know, hosting things like a, a NATO policy hackathon and, and all of these kinds of new types of engagements that we're seeing and, and the young, young leaders group, which I think is really important. Um, and I hope that in the future, we can even do a better job of not just creating separate youth formats, but really bringing next gen leaders to the adults table and have them work shoulder to shoulder with current policymakers. So that way we're building relationships, we're sharing insights and we're creating a new shared experiences together that will help keep the Alliance healthy and alive for years to come. Um, so I would just say in, in closing, um, NATO shirt sure, has to become more, more global, dynamic, diverse. It has to gradually start to incorporate some of the next generation's priorities like hybrid threats, emerging and disruptive technologies, human security, the security effects of climate change. But it's not about tearing up the NATO agenda entirely. It's about how to find ways of communicating what NATO is already doing on these issues and why it should matter to the next generation today. And final thought is just from the US perspective, I think there is a strong desire among young Americans to preserve the transatlantic, transatlantic relationship. You know, US support for, for NATO is still high, despite the very real skepticism about America, you know, um, having the need to focus on the challenges at home as opposed to abroad. But I think, you know, the Pew statistics are somewhere around, you know, 70% of public support for NATO. And I think many young Americans have studied abroad in Europe. They have some kind of personal connection to the region. And, and I think fundamentally, there's also the recognition that the challenges we face today transcend borders and they require um, unprecedented global cooperation to address. And so I think the next generation is up for that. And the Biden administration brings a new wave of hope for, for many of these multilateral champions. So I would just say as, as the next US administration um, you know, seeks to renew ties with Europe, it should choose a few of these priorities, really focus on consulting and rallying NATO into action on these things and eventually build them into NATO's new strategic concept, which I think is on the horizon. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing your insights on how to update uh, NATO, integrate younger generations better. Um, and it actually brings, uh, brings me to our third speaker today, uh, Linda Desmale, who is a PhD researcher at the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy at the Brussels School of Governance at the VUB. Um, and in her PhD, she really focuses on the evolution of the status of Europe in American grand strategy, especially as Washington rebalances the Indo-Pacific region. So that's why I wanted to ask you, Linda, um, in addition to the priorities we already heard for NATO and when it comes to security and defense, what transatlantic challenges um, deserve immediate attention under the Biden administration when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region? And how are such challenges perceived by the next generation? Uh, are those perceptions different than we see uh, in other generations? Um, okay, that's that's quite a that's quite a um, that's quite a question. But um, so thanks also, of course, for inviting me uh, to this. Um, and so, I mean, as already was alluded to, I think surely in the past uh, couple of years and in the past four years, especially, uh, there's really been some important questions raised about uh, the future of, of the transatlantic relationship. So I very much welcome this opportunity to exchange uh, views a bit on on as what you said, what challenges deserve uh, most immediate attention. Of course. In, in my own humble uh, opinion. And perhaps if I try to kind of group together your, your question overall, uh, I'll, I'll perhaps uh, maybe zoom in on, on three uh, type of broad reflection about thinking when thinking about the future of transatlantic relations or three things that I think are very important. And all of this against this background, as you mentioned, of some of more of the more fundamental uh, power related changes that we are witnessing today. So um, especially then uh, this, this rise of Asia and also this rise of China and this increasing importance of the Indo-Pacific and these questions that, that, uh, that um, policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic are, are asking in this regard. And so uh, first, I think um, I would definitely like to make the case to uh, when we think about the future, when we think about transatlantic relationship, to really increasingly not speak about the transatlantic relationship as some sort of a single bilateral interaction, but to rather speak of, of a set of relationships in the plural sense that occur between the United States and European countries, like at the bilateral level, obviously within a NATO uh, format, but also increasingly between the United States and the European Union within some sub uh, regional formats. Um, we also shouldn't forget about Canada when we're speaking about NATO. 
And of course, then if we take this, uh, uh, when we move beyond the Euro-Atlantic uh, area, um, both sides also, of course, interacting in global fora, such as the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization. And now increasingly uh, from, from the US side, we see that the Biden administration seems to be envisaging some sort of a new uh, format of cooperation as well, some sort of an alliance of democracies with increased uh, interaction and cooperation, also not only with America's alliances in Europe, but also with uh, its alliance with, with its allies in Asia so to, to have some more uh, convergence there. So, I mean, the transatlantic relationship or the transatlantic relationships, it's about uh, a whole lot of issues. It's not only about security, but it's also about economics. It's also about uh, global norms. And, and as was mentioned by, by Lauren, a lot of this obviously goes back to the, uh, to the, to the Cold War when a strong U.S. Western Europe at the time bond was really deemed crucial uh, as, as a bulwark against the Soviet Union. But since then, of course, the world has changed. New powers have emerged or re-emerged. Uh, we've seen an enormous increase in, 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 in global economic interdependence, new, new challenges. And I, I think that the formats of transatlantic cooperation have definitely changed with that. I mean, NATO is not anymore what it used to be in 1949, the same for the European Union. Um, and so I think it's always important to still keep in mind, especially from a European point of view, that the memberships of all these institutions are not always the same and that the memberships of these institutions are susceptible to change, both enlargement as a decrease in members. So I think that this dynamism is, is definitely a source of strength and this adaptability. Um, but I do think it's important that when we talk about transatlantic relations to always try to also move beyond NATO. So NATO is, of course, the central pillar, but to also um, really, I think, really a challenge for the future is, is to make different formats of interaction also as mutually reinforcing as possible. I think NATO will be stronger if the US-EU relationship is constructive. And I think strong bilateral relations between individual countries can also be building blocks upon which to build broader coalitions. So just in terms of, of thinking about the transatlantic relations, I think it's, it's always important to think as inclusive and as, as multifaceted as possible, because I think that's really a source of strength, actually, uh, because it really just shows how much interaction and, and, and interconnection there is. Uh, but then second and, and relatedly, um, of course, there have always been some elements of friction between both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, there's always been some healthy economic competition. I think this will always be the case and this shouldn't be a fundamental problem. Today, there are some, 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 yeah, some discussions about, for example, a digital services tax, antitrust regulation, where we are not always 100% on the same uh, page. But I do think that uh, as we are really shifting to a geopolitical context in which the United States especially seems to be increasingly yeah, kind of rebalancing, if you will, to the Indo-Pacific or really prioritizing China and its foreign policy and, and for good reasons. And also given the fact that this Sino-American rivalry is to a large part, if not only, but to a large part really uh, playing out in the economic and in the technological domain, I really think that transatlantic economic relations will also become increasingly viewed through a strategic lens uh, in the future, not only by the United States, but also on the European side, because I think since the end of the Cold War, uh, policymakers have started to try to depoliticize economic interactions, if you will, and they've kind of considered the economic realm as something relatively isolated from national security. But I think we clearly see that this paradigm is, is under strain. And so I think that the United States and, and Europeans uh, really ought to think about what this means for them and, and about yeah, how this renewed centrality of geoeconomic competition also uh, will impact uh, transatlantic uh, cooperation. I, I really expect this to be an increasingly important topic uh, for the future. And then third, and also relatedly, I also think that one of the lessons of the past couple of years is that we, uh, we cannot forget also the importance of domestic politics in shaping uh, foreign policy. I mean, there's of course always a lot of, of continuity and, and as, as Lauren also said, some continuous support for NATO and, and some of these basic, very fundamental uh, elements. But then again, within countries and between different political families, there are also uh, even if we often share the same uh, problem analysis, I'm thinking, for example, about the rising China, even within the United States, we still see, and also in Europe, increasingly a domestic debate on what responses 
to have to that. And I think it's also important for both sides to be aware of these domestic debates and to really try to follow them because that will also increase understanding on, on both sides and, and make it easier to see uh, where the most fruitful avenues for, for cooperation uh, are. So I think this, this importance of domestic uh, politics and also in, in, a, in, a, in an American context, this increasing desire to link foreign policy immediately to the domestic uh, area precisely also to create uh, perhaps uh, sufficient public support. I really think this is something that in the future uh, we really uh, we really have to have to take into account and that we can really um, need to follow uh, a bit more. So I think overall I, I shared the um, I definitely share the optimism uh, about uh, the future of transatlantic relations. I think we surely have much more in common uh, than what sets us apart. But I do think if we wanna really make these relations as constructive as possible while recognizing that the world is not anymore the way it used to be when it all got started, so to speak, that it's important to think of these relations as broad and covering several policy domains to increasingly recognize that economics, that the transatlantic economy does not occur in a political vacuum. And I would also uh, argue that it's important to keep an eye on domestic politics uh, to increase understanding in, in that regard um, as well. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that, my, uh, my short uh, introduction remarks. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Linda, for explaining the transatlantic relationships, but also the importance of domestic politics. Uh, and before we turn to our final speaker, uh, please don't forget to submit, submit your questions. Um, and it brings us to uh, Youssef Kobo, who is the director of A Seat at the Table. Uh, through his work, Youssef uh, offers underprivileged youth opportunities to grow professionally. So that is why I wanted to ask you, Youssef, from your experience, how can young professionals make their voices heard when it comes to the transatlantic partnership? And how can they contribute to transatlantic relationships? Uh, great question. First of all, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, amongst uh, peers and uh, to be invited by a uh, two of our main partners, the German Marshall Fund in Brussels and the US Embassy to Belgium. Uh, there's a few things to add to the, the wonderful um, introductions by my three, three colleague panelists. Uh, I think most of the things that I wanted to say have been said already, but before I make that leap to what, what how can we engage the younger audiences? Uh, I, I do want to set the stage. Um, again, for me, it's very important. The past five, six years, we've been having interesting discussions over here in in Europe in terms of the transatlantic relationship, uh, disagreement with the, disagreements with the previous um, administration, uh, some talk in, uh, in uh, policy circles in, in France and Germany about decoupling uh, from NATO, decoupling from uh, the US relationship um, and, and, and so on. So I remember five to six years ago, there were more and more voices uh, here in Europe um, asking, well, what do we need? What do we need NATO for anymore? Uh, remember that, and this it was right before uh, Crimea happened. I think uh, it was around 2014. Um, the main challenge, I think, and also with younger generations, is we've been living in prosperity and safety and stability uh, for so long, for over seven decades now, that we have forgotten um, uh, where the stability and prosperity comes from, and. Uh, that shared history that uh, that we have between uh, uh, both places. So that prosperity, that safety, that stability that comes from somewhere that comes from the giant offers we've made in the in the past and the, the uh, current international rules based order that we put in place at huge cost over uh, the past uh, uh, most of the past uh, seventy years. Uh, so. My main point being the younger generation has forgotten why we're so prosperous um, uh, today. And I do think if you wanna move on forward, it's very important um, that we remind our young, the, the next generation, the younger audiences about that shared history. And secondly, that we put them in positions that they can shape the future of the transatlantic relationship uh, themselves. Uh, what I have noticed in, all these engagements between the, uh, the US, EU, Belgium in, at, at conferences, at uh, bilaterals and so on. And uh, I, I, share, I, I share the insights of uh, Jakob. There's a lot of talk about our oh, checkbox youth engagement. 
but there's not a lot of room uh, made for young professionals to add to the conversation during uh, uh, during the discussions. And I want do want to applaud uh, the German Marshall Fund for that. So as previously mentioned, uh, the Brussels Forum is a great um, it's a great place where every single year uh, they allow some of the young professionals participating in different leadership programs uh, to say, to take the stage or uh, to to add a certain contribution to the discussion. So. Uh, I think all my colleague panelists have been in the exact same um, uh, positions before where, they, where they're in a room surrounded by uh, 50 plus uh, uh, policy makers with uh, 50 plus in age meeting and where they're discussing, where they're discussing the future of transatlantic relations. And I think from my end, being the founder of a seat at the table, which is a nonprofit that works predominantly uh, with students, young professionals, uh, young people from uh, disadvantaged communities or different backgrounds. Uh, I think it's very important that we give a seat at uh, these young people, a seat at the table where policy and decision, uh, policy and decision makers uh, reside. Uh, the name from the seat at the table came from a very famous quote by uh, Shirley Shalom, the, the very first African-American Congresswoman who once said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair and uh, that gave us the name for a seat at the table is that message that we're trying to instill in the younger generations uh, who are constantly um, seeing uh, we, we, we want to be heard we want to do things we want to create things and so on well our key message has always been bring a folding chair invite yourself that's how you get ahead in life and so i think it's up to um, up to the sponsors up to the um, policy and decision makers, the leaders of the day, the organizations, institutions, and governments behind that transatlantic relationship to further keep investing in spaces where we give young people, young professionals, students, and so on, an opportunity to share their ideas, to share their energies, to come together, to collaborate, and to start co-developing that future. If you look at um, the current uh, generation, generation, uh, um, who's behind the, um, let's say, um, the decisions that will change our lives, the younger generations for the coming decades. I, I, I've noticed a lot of um, uh, lethar lethargic voices. Uh, there's a lot of complacency. A lot of people are risk averse. And this in a time where the world is changing at a very rapid rate. History is accelerating. If you just see what we've been through in the past couple, of, in the past decade, the financial economic crisis, um, uh, the, the current COVID crisis and anything that happened in between. We see the rise of international terrorism, cyber warfare, populism, uh, climate change, and so on. So we need a fresh, to close off, we need a, fr uh, we need a fresh perspective. We need uh, younger people to, with their creativity, energy, and drive to solve the solutions of tomorrow. So it's, to us, uh, it's up to us to engage them, to incentivize them, to have their voices heard, and to work on these common issues. It's, it's on the governments and organizations and institutions, the think tanks uh, behind this relationship uh, to give them the space and to support them, uplift them, and to tap, tap their minds and that energy and that drive to uh, uh, steer forward. Because again, if you look at, and this finally to, cl to close off, if you look at the, the predictions of the IMF and the World Economic Forum of who will be the, the biggest uh, eco economists, economists in, the, in the world, the biggest nations in the world, uh, by two, 2050, uh, you will see a, a phenomenal shift. A shift um, in that top ten, you will see a couple of countries with different value systems that will all of a sudden have the economic, military, uh, uh, military, and uh, um, political leverage to shape the world as we did in the post uh, uh, World War II era. So. We need to address that the international rules-based order is being challenged, is being attacked. And from there on, we, we need to think, rethink that, realign and rethink that all conversation and that relationship and, and more importantly, the solution. So uh, that's, that's it from my end. So younger people need to uh, ask, need to bring a folding chair uh, to get behind that policy or decision making table. Secondly, organizations, institutions need to make way, need to make uh, need to provide places and opportunities for the younger generation to contribute to this conversation, discussion, 
and to possible solutions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Youssef. So don't forget to bring a, to bring a folding chair the, the next uh, the next time. Um, so you really stressed the idea that young people people can definitely be active drivers of change, and that actually ties in with one of the questions that we received. Um, this question is from Donna Tien Ri, and she asks, "Did you have a positive experience in engaging current policymakers and encouraging them to include next gen voices?" So she says, often it seems when, um, when we say we have to think of the younger generations, that it's more performative. So that kind of ties in what, what was said, that it's kind of a checking box sometimes. Uh, and she asks, how can we take that seat at the table without creating an us-them divide? Um, does any one of you want to tackle this question? Youssef, maybe you can, you can start. Yeah. Well, uh uh, if I can just weigh in, uh, so the main setup of a seat at the table is organizing events with, with the younger generation and leading figures. So on a daily basis, we'll have uh, Euro commissioners, ambassadors, generals, uh, ministers, heads of states and CEOs. But again, we've been asking that uh, seat at the table or or ourselves. What I've noticed is uh, a lot of leading figures are e eager to tap the minds of, of the younger generation, uh, but within their organization, there are very few that are actually um, setting these types of conversations, round tables, etc. Up. So I think it's it's up to us to uh, uh, knock on that door or or even kick in that door and uh, to get that space. But I, I do want want to want to challenge the assumption uh, leadership is not interested in hearing younger voices. Or they're, they're not guiding us. They're not mentoring us. They're not helping us. Um, I think the goodwill is there. But it's up to us to uh, to get that place, to to get that conversation, to um, uh, to, to get a seat at the table here, yeah. Lauren. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, John, if you want to respond to that as well, because you've also been very active when it comes to youth engagement around NATO. Um, well, most of I think the the positive uh, things are the use of approach, kicking in the door, and bring your own chair. Um, so I, I definitely don't think we should have this sort of entitled ideas like, hey, we're young people who want to be here. If, you, if you're if you not proactive enough, then yeah, you get passed over. It's not because you're young, it's just because you were passive. Um, so that's, I, I don't think that's a generation thing. Um, but I do have plenty of positive um, experiences where indeed when, when you sort of just knock on the door and ask that they're actually like, oh yeah, I actually didn't consider that. I was like, yeah, we didn't really know how to reach out. So it's, it's more, much more often a, a connecting problem than something about being unwilling. Um, I think one very nice example was, was really at the end of my term as president of YATA. Uh, we were in, doing an engagement with the uh, Command and Control Center of Excellence, so a very technical specific one from, from NATO, which happens to be based here in Utrecht. And they were hosting a conference on the command post in the future, I think in the 2035 or 2040. Um, but who did they ask to talk about that? The current generation of, of commanders, which of course, two star, three star generals, uh, highly respectful people, lots of brain power on there, um, uh, nothing there. But basically, I just asked, like, right, if you're talking about the command post in 2040, shouldn't you be inviting the people that will likely be commanders back then? So, so sort of my generation of lieutenant captains, those kind of people, because probably they have an opinion about it. And that was received really, really well. And we were able to bring in, I think, in total there were 10, 15 youngsters, uh, people from Ukraine military academy from the Dutch and so on. But that was all very, very positive, but you just have to ask that question. And I think that that goes for most uh, in these kind of type of engagement that we, we sort of also look at these institutions and think, oh, right, that's a huge monolith there. Um, and that guy looks very, very important. Um, I'm not even going to ask, uh, but you have to. Um, and I think then, then indeed, there's also a role for social for civil society. And I think civil society, at least linked to NATO, is absolutely doing a fabulous job on there. In sort of showing the examples. Um, indeed, as, as Yusuf uh, already explained, uh, GMF Young Professional Summit, uh, NATO engaged in wonderful thing, um, Eastern Europe GlobeSec, I think, is doing a wonderful job with the GILF program, where they simply pick up a young person, like put them on stage, like, hey, now go talk to uh, ACT, and, and sure, the young person's like, uh, do I really have to? It's like, yeah, you have to. Um, but these kind of things do sort of set uh, the example, and, and uh, we, we hope that, that, of course, will inspire other people to do that the same. Great, 
Great, thank you. That really underlines the importance of being proactive when it comes to uh, youth, youth engagement. Um, I also received another question from Anna Flotoliers. That's about uh, the narrative. So do you think the narrative underpinning transatlantic relations still holds true for the younger generation in general? Or is there a need to revise it in order to foster broader and deeper engagement? I think that ties in with something you said earlier, Lauren. So if you could um, quickly respond to that. Sure, I think that's a that's exactly the right question to ask um, and to think about how we we understand and communicate around these issues. Um, as as I was alluding to earlier, I mean, I think this kind of um, lofty notion that the United States and Europe are better off together than apart because we stand for the same kind of shared values, you know, democracy, human rights, freedom, um, all of these things. And we've built our societies, um, our, our collective societies and our kind of international order based on all of these principles is a very powerful argument. And I think that certainly still resonates, especially as we start to see, you know, revisionist powers and, and um, other powers rising, trying to challenge these values or offer alternative models of governance and how we organize society, thinking of, you know, China and also Russia. Um, I think that very much still resonates, perhaps more than it has in recent years before we sort of start to see the shift back to great power competition, if you will. Um, so I think that part is true, but, do I think that there are needs, there's a need to update that? Um, absolutely. I think there is a, a very broad notion, you know, people, people understand that NATO is important. So I think that leads to artificially high statistics of support. Like people think it's the right thing, but they don't necessarily know why they think that. So I think there's definitely a need to dig down deeper and, and to tease out some of those, the, the facts that kind of support that and, and, I think for the next generation, that looks a lot different. You know, maybe some of those reasons are the fact that NATO is tackling different kinds of challenges that we see today than, than NATO was stood up to, to tackle. So I think there are definitely some um, ways that we can change the way we talk about this. And it's not all about, you know, bullets and tanks. It's also about bits and bytes and things that NATO is doing in the information space and, um, you know, things that that young people see as fundamental challenges today. And so changing the way that NATO is viewed, not in the very fundamental sense that it exists to protect our values, but, but talking more about the way that NATO has adapted to meet today's challenges um, and, and getting the next generation bought in so that, you know, we're all using the same language, I think is definitely important. Thank you. I think you made a very important point that, of course, there are also emerging challenges, new challenges that need to be included as well when we talk about the importance of the alliance. Um, I also wanted to turn to you, uh, Linda, because if we're talking about framing and a narrative, um, of course, your idea of talking about transatlantic relationships as plural also comes in here. Um, so can you also share some thoughts about what you think the narrative should, uh, should include? Um, yes, I mean, of course, I mean, obviously, this is just also my opinion, but I do think and actually it links back to, to what some of the previous speakers also said, um, is that especially from a European perspective, when, when thinking about international things that immediately impact them, a lot of them, I think, will think first about the European Union, perhaps, and, and in a second, and, and, and in a secondary, or not in a secondary way, but afterwards NATO, because the European Union is perhaps more in their heads associated with economic issues, which has a much clearer direct impact on, 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 on the individual uh, lives. But I think in terms of, of the narrative, I mean, I think the discussion could be broadened to the fact that Sometimes, especially in national political debates, we kind of speak as if the policies we enact that they, they that they occur in some sort of a vacuum. But actually, even a lot of things that we consider domestic policy is inherently international. Uh, and this is the case. I mean, for example, technology being over being all around us and being, per definition, transnational. Um, economics, climate change, but this, inter this information and then the fact that this information uh, could perhaps um, or has already been impacting elections in democracies and these type of things. So what I think is important is, in, is perhaps in the public debate to make this clear link about 
this, this clear link between what you do as a country on the international stage or what's happening around you really has a direct impact on you as an individual citizen to make it a bit more tangible as well. Because speaking about tanks, I think for a lot of people, it remains a very something very far away, something very abstract and, and something it's not clear to me how that impacts me. So I think by making it tangible and, and by coming up with, with clear examples of how your individual country or how Europe as a whole and how the Euro-Atlantic area as a whole is actually inherently part of something broader. Uh, and I think if, if you can underline these, these, um, these connections more, that will also create more public debate about this and, and probably also more support for what a lot of these uh, institutions such as NATO indeed is doing when it comes to countering disinformation, when it comes to uh, building resilience, when it comes to cyber, cyber, uh, cyber topics and so on. Great, thank you. And one of the aspects you also mentioned uh, is the economic dimension. And we actually got two questions about it from the audience. Um, we got a question from Henning from Stein, and we also got a question from Felix Hoffman. Um, the first question relates to, to TTIP, what we can learn from that, what lessons can Europe and the US take um, about this, uh, the negotiations on this trade agreement. Um, but also, if you could reflect also um, what the key economic challenges will be for transatlantic uh, collaboration. Um, since you already mentioned e economics, maybe you can quickly respond to this, Linda? Um, yes, of course. I mean, I'll 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 uh, I'll, I'll start, and, and I would be very happy for the other panelists, of course, to to complete uh, or correct anything I'm saying here. Uh, perhaps uh, about uh, TTIP. Um, I think the story of of TTIP is uh, some is kind of a story glass half full, glass half empty, depending on what you look at it, because uh, one of the reasons, of course, why uh, TTIP was a very difficult negotiation and, and failed. It's also, of course, because trade and economic relations between Europe and the United States is already very integrated. Uh, and so if you want to integrate that even more, then of course you really start touching up on some of the more sensitive issues in, in economics. <coughs> And for that reason, it is inherently a difficult negotiation. And then secondly, I don't think we will see some sort of a renewal there uh, anytime uh, soon, because I don't think in the domestic areas of, of both sides, there is actually a lot of uh, support for that. So when it comes to standard setting and economic integration, I actually think that perhaps the way to go would more to seek to um, focus more on the WTO level, reform there, try to make that be more um, effective again, also to increase public um, public trust in, in, in that institution and in, in the overall uh, trading regime um, as a whole. Uh, and then perhaps the, the, the second question uh, very briefly, um, some of the challenges or some of the opportunities in economic cooperation, right? Um, so, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, economics, the, 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 I think there's two, two uh, key issues that are becoming increasingly prominent. So first, there's the whole uh, technology and everything that has to do with technology and has to do with data and everything, which is, of course, which is a security topic and an economic topic at the same time. Uh, but where you also always have to make this trade-off between right economic efficiency sometimes and security, uh, security considerations. I mean, we've really seen this play out, of course, in the whole 5G uh, debate. So I think the technology question is definitely going to be a pickle. But we do see on both sides of the Atlantic a really a, a, a demand, I mean, an, an interest from policymakers to engage and to have a dialogue about this. Uh, but I do think it is something indeed where the US and Europeans are not automatically on the same page, but it's not because that is not the case yet that we shouldn't be having this conversation and that we shouldn't be looking for, for areas where cooperation is possible. So I think technological, um, the technological um, aspect is, is, um, is definitely um, key there. And then uh, secondly, the, yeah, and related to that, every, uh, everything uh, that has to do with data. I'm sorry, I already mentioned that. And then perhaps in a in a in a weird way, because it's it's not directly economics. There's also a conversation to be had about sanctions and about the way that sanctions 
um, and the extraterritorial uh, extraterritoriality of sanctions. I think that's also definitely an important conversation to be had between both sides um, of the Atlantic. And I think, I mean, these are and these are topics, uh, complicated topics, and. I'm going a little bit, I'm, I'm being a little bit chaotic there, but the technology question also touches back on any questions about industrial, uh, about industrial policy. So, I mean, I think that all of the topics, all of the economic topics that there will be a transatlantic discussion about are topics that are inherently difficult. Uh, and it's not as if we automatically converge on them, but I do think it's important to have a dialogue about this. And I do think that, uh, especially now with the incoming Biden administration, there is a political climate that is open to having this dialogue because in the past couple of years, the, the discussion, the, the idea was more like, let's just not talk about it and both do our own thing. And I do think that now we've reached a political situation where there is a willingness to, to cooperate, but, um, that, that uh, there's going to be some tough discussions uh, going forward. I'm sorry, this was a little bit uh, chaotic, but um, if any of the other speakers perhaps uh, can come with some organization in everything I just said. I think this was great, Linda. You also already highlighted a lot of the different aspects. So on the one hand, there's economics, then there's also tech, security. Maybe the biggest challenge for the coming years will be climate change. And that is also why I wanted to ask um, how can organizations such as NATO respond to such new challenges, such as climate change? Um, how can we adapt it and upgrade their mission? Um, Lauren, do you want to tackle this question? Sure. So I think we've seen actually very recently um, encouraging language coming from NATO leaders and, and Secretary General Stoltenberg himself actually ha has taken up this issue and speaking about why climate change is a NATO issue or or, or perhaps I should say the security effects of climate change are, are a NATO issue. Um, and so I think that comes in, in a couple of different ways. I mean, obviously climate change has an impact on our environment and that has security implications. So when you know we're starting to see things like melting ice, that has implications for where NATO operates in the maritime domain for, for what different um, different nations are able to do, whether they're adversaries or competitors of the transatlantic relationship and where they are able to overlap with our strategic interests. So these things have very, these, these climate phenomena have very concrete um, impacts for NATO operations, for NATO activities. So I think it's, it's there's a growing understanding now why this is um, an issue that, that matters for NATO as a defense alliance. Um, I think in terms of what we can do, the, the value add I think of NATO here is its ability to be a coordinating function and also a standard setter. So um, things that NATO can do, uh, provide a table for the debate uh, to talk about what needs to happen around climate change and to get um, leaders on the same page and develop an agenda. We can start to set standards for, you know, sustainable um, guidelines for how we run our militaries and our forces. We can start to set standards for, um, you know, how our our equipment to make sure that that is sustainable and and with, whether it's emissions or other kinds of factors. So there there are various things I think that NATO can do to try and create more sustainable activities for the alliance. And and even though NATO might not have all the enforcement mechanisms, we can at least be a platform for debate, for setting the agenda, and for setting guidelines and standards. Great, that's indeed a very good comment that NATO can really play a coordinating and standard setting role in this, this regard. Do you share this perspective, uh, John? Of course, slightly then putting on the, uh, the military hat. Um, I, I, I do agree in, in that sense, and, and we often have this discussion at work, whether um, this should be, like, there's not a military issue, it's like, why should there be a military solution? Um, and in that sense, that NATO then is associated with being completely a military entity, which, of course, already one falsehood because it's, it's political, it's much larger than that. Um, but one thing that I, I like about um, NATO's involvement now in this, and that, that need matches with, with what Lauren has said about setting standards, is that often a lot of technology is, is military-driven. There, there was a military necessity to create something to be able to communicate, and voila, we have the internet. Of course, it was slightly more difficult than that, but that was, was the, the core principle. Um, and so I, I could also imagine that a lot of the uh, climate, environmental technology and such uh, will first have a military application and, and then also be used uh, civilian-like. Like 
personally, I would love if I could have a forward operating base that's completely energy independent because that's strategical and tactical, very valuable. That then that also is very useful and very nice for the environment. That would then be our bonus. But the technology is then being developed for a reason and can be used for other goals as well. Um, so I, I feel that um, NATO has a, lot, a large role to play in the whole R&D concept. Luckily, we've also said that we would invest in R&D. I think it's 20% or something. Um, so there's a lot of investment in technology development going on. Um, I think there could be a large focus on, on climate change. Yeah, clear. Um, I also wanted to quickly get back to you, Youssef, because we already also mentioned technology. Of course, young people are particularly talented when it comes to come to technology. I mean, we grew up with the internet, social media. Uh, how, how can we make sure we really take advantage of this talent that, that young people have? Um, and maybe also make a better distinction of what we consider youth. So, of course, on the one hand, there are students, on the other hand, there are young professionals from to ages 25 to 35. So how can we better differentiate what every group can contribute to the debate? Yeah, well, absolutely. So uh, 16 to 35 is what, what, what I define you, uh, uh, quote unquote, within my organization. But definitely, right, um, this generation, Gen Z and millennials are all digital natives, they've been, they've been raised with uh, laptops, PCs, smartphones, uh, social media, and so on. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I hear at a lot of major organizations and businesses is they'll have one of their juniors, their young professionals coaching their C, C suits on what's going on on uh, different platforms. So this is a thing that goes on at a lot of institutions and a lot of businesses. Uh, leading businesses where they have their young people, uh, where they invite their executive uh, young people to the executive floor to come and explain what's this thing, what's all the fuss about with uh, uh, SoundCloud, TikTok, and, and and so on. So it's a very important one that um, at the strategy level, you have a couple of young people uh, weighing in on the conversations, discussions. Strategy is mostly uh, the, the CSOs at many organizations are predominantly uh, people who've been through the ranks and uh, at, the, at the end of their careers, 50, at the, at the end of 50, somewhere like that. And that's the thing that concerns me. One of the biggest, maybe the biggest change um, at institutions and business in business is digital. Everybody's focused on di digital. So that's the main issue with that. If you don't have, have any digital natives on the executive floor, it's an important one, or at least... Um, uh, on, the, on the board level. So that's one thing. J just to give you an, an idea of how big the shift is. Remember back in 20, 2010, the economists would always publish uh, um, the biggest uh, businesses per sector. In back in 2010, oil was dominating the biggest, uh, in the ranking of the biggest corporations around the world. And just in a matter of 10 years, it's predominantly data-driven uh, corporations like the Facebooks, the, um, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Amazons, and so on. So that, that's the, that is still under leverage. So a thing that gets often forgotten is um, security, the, the stability and the safety of a nation comes from somewhere. It's economic prowess and it's uh, military. It can, uh, and what drives that economic uh, military, it's, it's economic prowess. And so if we don't invest in, in digital, we, we don't have the capacity um, to, save, uh, to safeguard our prosperity in the near decade. So definitely bring, bring more young people and young professionals at your organizations within, uh, within the spaces that decide over uh, the shifts in the coming decades. I'm, I'm so glad that it got the... Uh, uh, take this topic because that's so when it comes to technology innovation go to the people that are born with it uh, um, that are work that are working on a daily basis with it where it comes naturally to, to them instead of um, uh, it's my favorite example just remember the I think in 2018 the US Congress hearings uh, with Mark Zuckerberg the Facebook CEOs and we had where well, you had US leadership all these senators uh, from across the aisle in, in, um, interviewing Mark Zuckerberg and, and them not even having the slightest clue how to send an email. And if, if that's at your uh, 
policy making uh, uh, level at the decision making level. That's that's a concern to me. So again, uh, digital is very important. You can see that by the success of the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Teslas of this world. So investing, bringing young people who are which where digital comes naturally to them to uplift them, empower them, and put them in the prop proper leadership positions. Uh, that would be a final one for me, a very important one. Uh, it will be th the next decades will be decided by uh, who will come out on top. Would it, will it be EU, US, or China? Will it be EU and US? It will all come down to who has the digital infrastructure, who has the most successful uh, digital ecosystem and corporation and so on. So definitely not underestimate that the link between technology, innovation and young people, it's there and we're not we're underusing that, we're underestimating that. So definitely do something with that. Thank you, Yusuf. And that actually brings me to, to the final question. Uh, what will be the most important topic for transatlantic relationships in the coming 10 years for young people. If you could all very quickly respond to that in one or two words, uh, maybe I can start with you, Yusuf, because from your side, it seemed to be uh, technology and digital. Yeah, again, for me, it will be digital. Uh, I think Europe is looking for ways to establish their own Silicon Valleys. If you look at um, the, the tax 40, the 40 biggest uh, uh, German companies, if you put them all together, they're, they're still smaller than uh, Germany being the biggest economy of Europe. And if you put their 40 biggest companies together, they're still, still smaller than Microsoft. They're still smaller than Amazon. They're still smaller than Google. So Europe has some, uh, um, is still looking for a way to catch up with the US and, and China when it comes to digital ecosystem. So, and that's the thing that, that's, I think a topic that you can engage very, on. Very short, uh, Yusuf, yeah. <laughs> So, again, um, so, so digital and tech, digital and tech from your side, definitely. What do you think, Laura? Lauren, will be the most important uh, topic? Sure, I, I agree on tech, but to throw another one out there very quickly, I would say hybrid threats, um, being able you know, I think that we're in the hybrid war right now. You know, that's the strategic competition. So for NATO to be able to find how to better compete in the below Article 5 space, I think is going to be absolutely critical. Clear. What do you think, John? I would go for uh, governance. Um, currently, we are already starting to become the grumpy old man. It's about the next generation after us, not about us anymore. You know, I think it's called Generation Z or I, I Gen, whatever it is. Um, with a less focus on, on strong institutions, governments, church and so on, that, that's all getting let go. Uh, but they will have to find a place in the, the world and we have to make sure that they have a place. Great. And you, Linda, what do you think? So surprise, surprise, I'm going to have to say, I think the China theme will be the most important one. Um, also because that's what I'm doing my research about. So that's obviously also the debates that I'm most familiar with. But most importantly, I think that the way that both Europe and the US uh, individually as well as collectively develop their relationships uh, with China really actually is also a place where a lot of these other themes that were mentioned before come, uh, come together. So I think this is kind of the... The, this 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 power shift and, and this this really this 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 shift of global power to Asia and to China more in particular is really the background condition against which all of these in my opinion against which all of these other debates are ultimately uh, being uh, held. So I would say that the China file is is, is the key one. Thank you. Interesting. A lot of different topics that will be very important in the coming 10 years. And on this note, we will have to uh, close the event. A huge thank you for the U.S. Embassy to Belgium. Uh, a huge thank you to our speakers, of course, and, and all of our participants. And also a big thank you to the organizers, Bruno Leite and Victoria Chumenko, for organizing this, uh, this event. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.